Mm. Science. You'll often hear researchers talking about three flavors of neutrinos. That's how they lured me in. Physicists highly motivated by food. Unfortunately, it turns out we can't actually taste neutrinos. Instead, flavor is just a fancy way of saying type. We've become acquainted with one flavor of neutrinos on this series: electron neutrinos and antineutrinos. Those were detected in Project Poltergeist, emitted by bananas, and seen in a nearby supernova. But today, on Even Bananas, we'll explore the other two flavors that neutrinos can take on. Much like how chemists like to group elements logically in the periodic table, physicists like to lump together similar particles in what we call the standard model. One of the groups of particles in the standard model is the leptons, home to our trusty neutrinos. Also in the lepton group is the electron, powering the device you're watching this on, and two similar but heavier particles, the muon and the tau. Since all of these particles are tiny, the idea of one being heavier can be pretty abstract. But if we scaled an electron up so it had the mass of a mouse, the muon would be like a cat, and the tau would be a kangaroo. Side note: This trifecta of different generations of particles is one of the big questions in physics. Why are there three similar versions of an electron rather than just one or two or four? We just don't know, and it keeps us up at night. Anyway, these three leptons each have a different flavor of neutrino as a sort of best friend. In fact, the neutrinos are such big fans of their charge partner pals that they echo their names, and so we have the electron, muon, and tau neutrinos. These besties are often spotted together, skipping merrily through a field, or at least through an electric field in a particle detector. When electron neutrinos interact with matter, they typically produce electrons. Muon neutrinos tend to produce muons, and tau neutrinos, you'll be surprised to hear, produce taus. Modern experiments can identify electrons and muons fairly easily, so the electron and muon flavors of neutrinos aren't too hard to study. Tau neutrinos are a lot trickier. A tau lepton is over three thousand times heavier than an electron, so it takes a lot more energy to create. Much like sculpting a life-size kangaroo takes a lot more clay than a life-size mouse. That means that most neutrinos from the sun, supernovae, and even many particle accelerators don't have enough energy to create a tau. And when a lucky high-energy tau neutrino does create a tau lepton in our detectors, the tau is often moving too slowly for us to spot it, like a sleeping kangaroo hidden in the brush. To fully understand the weird behaviors of neutrinos, we want to study all three of the types. The fact that we're able to do so is the result of a lot of clever science and engineering. To tell the story of the discovery of the muon and tau neutrinos, I'm joined by Fermilab archivist Valerie Higgins. So, in 1960, physicists knew that the neutrino existed, but most of them thought that there was just one type of neutrino. But there were two theoretical physicists, uh, T. D. Lee and C. N. Yang. Who pointed out that there was a particular kind of particle decay that you would expect to observe if there was just one type of neutrino, but you would not expect to observe it if there was more than one type, and that particular particle decay was not observed. And so this was evidence that there might be more than one type of neutrino. And so three physicists named Melvin Schwartz, Jack Steinberger, and Leon Letterman decided to set up an experiment to look into this. So they set up this experiment at Brookhaven National Lab and sent this beam of neutrinos to a detector and looked to see if it produced electrons and muons or if it only produced muons. If it produced just muons, then that would show there was a second type of neutrino, the muon neutrino. And in fact, that's what they saw. They saw just muons, which、uh, demonstrated that there was this second type of neutrino. Ledermann, Steinberger, and Schwartz actually won the Nobel Prize in 1988 for their discovery of the muon neutrino, but also for the method they invented to make a neutrino beam for their experiment. That neutrino beam method is now being used by all the neutrino experiments at Fermilab, including Microbrun and June that I work on. So, with the muon neutrino discovered, scientists went looking for the tau neutrino. Back to Valerie. 
Yeah, so in 1975, scientists at SLAC discovered uh, the tau lepton. And so once they discovered the tau lepton, they knew there was probably a third corresponding type of neutrino. So in 1997, there was an experiment at Fermilab called Donut that was created to start looking at this at this question. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a kind of fun name. I think it's the scientists having a bit of fun there uh, because it stands for direct observation of the new tau donut. Uh, they collected data for the next three years. Um, they observed millions of interactions during that time. Um, and finally, in 2000, they had enough uh, data collected that they were able to show that they had observed four tau neutrino interactions. And that was enough to say they directly observed the tau neutrino. Four! Four neutrinos over three years! On Microboon, we're lucky. We see about one neutrino every 10 minutes, but then we're not looking for tau neutrinos. My hat is off to the very patient donut collaborators who poured over that data. So now you know the full story of how we discovered the three known flavors of neutrino. In an upcoming episode, we'll explore how those three types might not be as separate as we think. Make sure to check out all our other Even Bananas videos on Fermilab's YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And what's your favorite neutrino flavor? Electron, muon, or kangaroo? I mean, tau. Or is some flavor of anti-neutrino more your style? Let us know in the comments. Fun fact, Leon Lederman became Fermilab's second director, and he had quite the sense of humor. For example, check out this form thank you letter he made to send people after winning the Nobel Prize. He also made some interesting fashion choices. I'll put links to these archival gems in the video description below. 